today's speakers. Oh, hold on. What do you got? <laughs> we went a little too far there. Um, but uh, we do have some really great speakers today. Um, we have, uh, hold on, sorry, there, there we go. Now, now we're on the right slides. Uh, I am not Alan Schimmel, as most people would know. Uh, this is Charlene O'Hanlon. I'm the managing editor at DevOps.com, uh, and I'm speaking in Alan's stead today, um, who sends his regrets for not being able to join us today. But also on today's webinar, we have Carmen DiArdo who is the technology leader at Nationwide Insurance. Welcome, Carmen. Glad to be here. We also have Donovan Stevens, who is the business integration specialist at the South African Revenue Service. Welcome, Donovan. Happy to have you here. Thank you, and good evening from South Africa. <laughs> and finally, we have Rachel Reinitz, who is the distinguished engineer and CTO of IBM Blue Mix Garage. Welcome, Rachel. Happy to have you here as well. Good morning from California. <laughs> so we do have the morning, afternoon, and evening covered. That's great. Okay, well, moving on, um, I believe we want to start with Rachel. Um, you can tell us a little bit about yourself and tell us a little bit about Bluemix. Sure. So I am, um, I am a distinguished engineer, so I'm a technical leader. I've actually been working on IBM Bluemix, which is our IBM Cloud offering and has platform as a service and also has now integrated our infrastructure as a service software. I've worked on it from the very beginning. I lead a consulting practice called the IBM Bluemix Garage, which works with clients on adopting um, DevOps and design thinking and lean startup and creating innovative applications on our platform. And we have sort of the uniqueness of being housed in startup communities around the world. So I do a lot of work on DevOps, and I also co-lead our IBM Bluemix Garage method that I'm going to talk a little bit about. Great. Thank you. Donovan, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, your, your role in, uh, at, at SARS? Okay. My name is Donovan Stevens. Uh, I'm a business integration specialist uh, at the South African Revenue Service. So we are essentially the agency responsible for all of the tax revenue collection um, here in South Africa, kind of like the IRS in America, but way better. Um, <laughs> we are also uh, responsible for all of customs in South Africa, so all of the um, cargo that come into the country and that are exported out of the country that flow through all of our border posts. Uh, is also part of our responsibility in terms of uh, the systems, the enterprise applications that facilitate the trade. And I'm on a team uh, called the Enterprise Systems Management Team. So our primary responsibility is to monitor all of these critical enterprise applications and obviously liaise with the relevant teams or stakeholders and um, do all of the event management and enrichment and ensure that these systems are always up and available and performing to the expected level of performances. Excellent. Thank you, Donovan. Carmen, uh, let's hear a little bit about what you're doing these days. Thanks, Charlene. So I work for Nationwide, which you know obviously is very diversified in terms of insurance, banking, retirement plans, pet insurance, etc. I've been, you know, several years now, kind of one of the leaders in the DevOps initiative where, you know, we're really looking at our delivery pipeline and how we can integrate and make it more efficient and uh, to accelerate our delivery. Um, now that's kind of things I'll be talking about here in a few minutes. Wonderful. Thanks, Carmen. Okay, so before we actually start the conversation, we do have a couple polling questions that we'd like to um, get you guys involved in. So uh, ready your mouse buttons. Here's the first one. How is your enterprise treating the adoption of DevOps? You can choose from running DevOps pilot projects, adopting DevOps for a few projects or teams, adopting DevOps across a line of business or division, adopting DevOps company-wide, or no plans to adopt DevOps. Go ahead and put in your 
answer and we'll give you guys about five seconds more and then we'll close it out. Okay. Closing it out. Here we go. There's, there's our answers. It looks like it's pretty evenly across the board at uh, various stages of DevOps adoption. That's really kind of interesting. Um, okay. Great, so we're going to be tweeting these uh, poll results out. So if you, if you have any, um, uh, if you have Twitter, go ahead and take a look at those. And here's our second polling question. What is the most important, what is most important in the earliest stages of the DevOps adoption? Select one of the following. Enable collaboration across all functions. Explore the products, technologies, and the tool chain define the processes, workflows, and feedback loops, or train practitioners in DevOps best practices. Again, we'll give you guys about 10 seconds or so to go ahead and get your answer in, and then we'll take a look at the poll results, which again, we will be tweeting that out on DevOps, at DevOps. Okay, we'll go ahead and close it out. Here are the, the answers. Oh, it looks like define the processes, workflows, and feedback loops was the largest uh, percentage out of this one followed by enable co collaboration across all functions. Again, really interesting uh, results there. Okay, I believe we have one more, and then we'll get on to the conversation. Do you see DevOps best practices, agile processes, et cetera, being cloned for other business units beyond IT in your enterprise? Simple yes or no question. Plenty of, uh, There we go. Okay, so we're going to give you guys about, well, I guess we're closing it. <laughs> Looks like the majority of you said yes, you do see uh, DevOps best practices, and that's such good news uh, for all involved. Okay, great. Well, back to the slide deck. Rachel, why don't you go ahead and get the conversation started? I'm happy to. Sit. So the first thing I was going to talk a little bit about is, um, you know, what are the elements that one needs to look at for DevOps and for, for scaled up adoption? And it really is those things that we were just kind of querying you on, which is um, our point of view is that there's a set of agile principles that you, you start from, that DevOps is really built upon. And that's where it was very gratifying to see how many see an adoption of some of those agile principles beyond IT with the business, because I think that's really critical for a larger impact for what DevOps is able to deliver. And then looking and thinking about DevOps principles themselves, automation, you know, responsibility, defining the processes. And then as we look at DevOps in IBM and, and what we've been working on, is a sort of beyond what's been the classic DevOps. Um, to really reaching into the partnership and the collaboration, particularly with the business side. So, you know, DevOps classically is, of course, development and operations, bringing that much more closely together with much greater automation. As we see, again, scaling the impact of DevOps, it's very much then going into a partnership with the business around the roles, around bringing user centricity, really focusing on the experiences one's delivering for users with design thinking, uh, bringing lean thinking as part of what's being done. Again, to not just develop in small chunks and deliver in small chunks, but to be deploying it and getting the feedback um, all the way out to end users. Another thing that we see as very important is the standardization on tooling and platform. And I will say that's also with a continued evolution. So you don't, you know, it's always this balance between being innovative, adopting new technologies, and yet also having a standard base that's allowing people to go faster, to have shared expertise, to, you know, have an automated tool chain right away. So what we've been doing um, in IBM both as we adopt DevOps within IBM, our own CIO's office is about 18,000 people, and then of course we have um, all the DevOps that we do in producing our products and, and our cloud offerings, we have open source, and then we have what we do with clients, which is a lot of what I lead. We brought that together around the kinds of core concepts, principles, and practices I was talking about into the garage method. 
Um, and that's a public site that's available. We've also incorporated it into it architectures and automated tool chains. And it's all about helping companies and particularly enterprises adopt DevOps and being able to scale it in these various different dimensions. And we do marry it very much with cloud adoption because cloud is providing such an acceleration uh, for the innovation side of things. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But the core of what we put forth in the method is applicable to all different kinds of DevOps adoption and applicable over into the business side that is, is collaborating with you. And these kinds of elements in the method can apply for a small innovation team to a mainframe team, you know, not all the tool chains would apply there, but a set of the principles certainly do, to scaling across the enterprise. And so let's look at another dimension of the enterprise, maybe going on to the next slide, please. Okay. Um, and, okay, I think that this, like, I, I think I want the slide after this. I think this got left in by accident. Um, somebody changed the slides. <laughs> that's okay. Let's go to the previous one. I'm not sure what happened there, but that's okay. Um, so talking about this, you know, as we have looked at um, adoption by enterprises in our own as well. We really see that there's it's a multi-speed environment, and one way of looking at it is to look at there as being this industrialized core that you see at the bottom. And this is really around you know very mission critical systems uh, that require a high degree of stability, reliability. Uh, um, predictability, all those kinds of illities, uh, often built on older technologies perhaps, uh, and not usually yet on the cloud, maybe, maybe they're virtualized, but not, you know, not in a, a full public cloud type of environment. And so there's a set of requirements there that really are, again, around um, sort of the steadiness of the systems, and it's okay to maybe go a little bit slower, or it's a necessity to maybe go a little bit slower. There's still a significant opportunity there to apply DevOps and to increase the speed at which uh, uh, changes are rolled in, to increase the automation, to increase testing. There's lots of opportunity there. But the drivers of what is most important in those systems is different, and the speed at which one is going to do deployments is going to be different than what we find above at the innovation edge, which is really about um, speed of delivery. You know, we want to deliver features very rapidly. We want to get the feedback quickly. We want to deliver in smaller chunks. Um, and the abilities, you know, reliability, scalability, security, all those still count. But what you want to do is um, design and architect the systems that you're building, these newer systems or migrating systems, to the right level of those abilities. You know, some may require five nines, but many of them are okay with not the that level of reliability that the industrialized core has has had. Um, and this is where we see um, a lot of DevOps adoption. We see it in both sides because there are drivers to become faster in both sides. Of course, when you're starting with sort of more of a green field, you have more choices. Uh, and you can bring in some of the most modern of tools. You can integrate SaaS products as part of your, your DevOps tool chain, et cetera. So both of these can, can benefit from DevOps. And as you go to now deploy an app, create a new application, for example, or add a feature to an existing application, in the enterprise, most likely you are crossing both these worlds. And you need um, capabilities from the industrialized core, perhaps physical machines that the production deployment will be onto if it's not deploying into a cloud environment, or APIs to get to your back-end databases, et cetera. And so there are a set of sort of key things to focus on as the integration points between your innovation edge that's going, you know, where you're delivering very fast and your industrialized core where you're delivering a bit slower. So the first one is, you know, planning. You know, it's really having that plan for when will the features be available because, um, and I've seen this unfortunately happen, 
you know, if you don't do some level of planning up front, even in the most agile of projects where you have dependencies on back end systems, you know, you may get your beautiful new front end application done, but it's not going to be able to deploy until those back end systems are ready. So I do believe that you need to do some level of planning and identification for what you need from the back end systems um, from that industrialized core ahead of time. And one of the key elements in getting that integration are APIs, um, as well as you know a continuous synchronization of what's occurring. Because as you're developing in an agile DevOps world and the innovation edge, you may see that oh, you know, there's an additional field that I need that needs to be communicated down to the industrial core teams, where they will then integrate that into you know their release plans. Um, and of course, you need to be monitoring across and able to do recovery. It's an ongoing kind of alignment. There is a level of orchestration. Um, you're, you're striving for as much independence of these systems as possible, and the APIs can help you with that. But there is that reality that if you need a new field in an existing system or if you need a certain calculation, that you're going to need changes in, in those industrialized core, in those, those systems. And also, you may be replacing part of it. You may be replacing part of an existing website and need a coordinated release. So some of those are the areas that um, we find you know, you need that level of synchronization, but it allows you then, if, when you come up with good processes there, now you can go fast in this multi-speed world. So let's go on to um, my last slide, please which is the one on culture. Yes, this one, thank you. So um, I did want to talk about, you know, kind of at what we believe as at, at the heart of scaling, and, and I believe is also at the heart of success here, which is really developing a DevOps culture. Um, and I know the other speakers are going to talk about their experiences with this as well. So typically what we see working is setting up a center of excellence, sometimes we call it center of competence, whatever you want to call it. And there's a couple of different structures that can be used there, some which are more um, sort of centralized and often setting the standards, perhaps providing the tool chains, providing some essential services. At times it is you know, staffed with uh, centralized staff and with a fairly um, you know, a fairly strong governance model that says, you know, here's a set of tool chains that you can use, and this is where you're allowed to make changes, et cetera. Sometimes it is done more on a community basis where there might be project team members um, from different parts of the business participating into it. It certainly is good to have community as part of it because you want the buy-in from the people. You want them to be contributing the great tools that they find. You know, it needs to be something that's alive and um, that, that is going to embrace new technologies and new ideas as they come along. I think at the very heart of a DevOps culture is this idea that everyone is responsible for successful delivery. And that includes even out to external stakeholders in terms of even getting the end customers, whoever those may be, and getting that feedback. Because it's not just about delivering the piece of software. It's about delivering software that matters to people, that fulfills their needs. And I think that absolutely critical for change um, and for culture is figuring out what your measures of success are. And we've been doing some very interesting work of integrating in metrics into our tool chains so that there's lots of kind of automated information about how frequently check-ins are occurring, how frequently production releases are occurring, what is the mean time for resolution for when a problem occurs um, in production, you know, those kinds of things, and making it very visible across the organization. And as you put those measures of success in place, you know, that's what people will, will work, work towards. So now we have an opportunity to hear from a, a couple of folks on their success in adopting DevOps. Yes, th thanks, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, thanks Rachel, I appreciate that. Um, Carmen, you're up next, and, and I would imagine that uh, given your, uh, the time that you've spent in the DevOps space, you've probably learned a few lessons or two, so um, we would love to hear what you have to say. Thanks, Charlene, and um, yeah, I would like to build off a lot of what Rachel has said. So. 
Um, from our perspective, it's kind of been a journey, or as, as it's shown here, a quest for being more responsive to the business. So we have this model, our, our house of DevOps, um, and it's built off of you know the concepts of starts out with kind of the three ways from Gene Kim, the Phoenix Project, right? System flow, feedback loops, and continuous experimentation. But the main cultures or the main practices, uh, pillars in the house are really around um, practices and also culture because as Rachel said, if you don't get the culture right, all the technology and the best practices aren't really going to be able to allow you to be effective. So. You know, from a practice perspective, um, organizationally, we have a centralized organization that kind of owns the delivery pipeline. So from my perspective, I kind of am the product owner of the delivery pipeline, but I also work with the application owners, the tool owners, to do R&D around how we can better effectively use it and integrate this, and I'll, I'll be showing that in a few slides. So if you look at kind of the model that we have, you know, on the practice side, I mean, these aren't probably aren't anything that people haven't seen before, right? Version control everything, so we're not just talking about our source code, we're talking about tests, we're talking about infrastructure, um, databases, you know, course automation, you know, how do we get better at automated testing? Um, we started with agile concepts about a decade ago, but what we found is that allowed us to go very quickly through our agile teams, but we still had issues flowing work to the backlog of our team and then implementing things down uh, to production. So, so automated testing needed to expand not just to the work we were doing within the iterations, but also anything around performance security, things of that nature. Um, obviously, continuous integration is a core practice, um, but then as you build on top of that, again, you really want automated infrastructure capability because if you talk to an agile team, they generally say they're waiting for something. If they, why can't you go faster? It's, well, they're either waiting sometimes for work because we don't have a continuous flow of work into the backlog of agile teams, Sometimes they're waiting for infrastructure, for environments, so that they can actually be working on testing or certifying the quality of the release. And then, as Rachel said, they're waiting for other teams to do for something, right? They may need a back-end service or a capability, so how do we work through that along with, you know, things like APIs, as Rachel said, and also some concepts like dark launching where you can actually deploy your changes without them being um, visible to the customer to allow you to continue to release so that later when that feature is available you can then do the testing and activate it. And then on top of all those things you, what, you know, is really continuous delivery. So once you have a lot of these capabilities going then you really can start to flow work from a business concept through your delivery and then get feedback and see how quickly you can go through that loop because I think as people like Mark Schwartz has talked about in his book, um, it's really a hypothesis, right? It's kind of a, a hypothesis of what you think might add value, what you think might help sell an insurance or a financial product, and how quickly can I get that out, get some feedback, and then based on that, you know, make any changes that I need in order to better serve our, our customers, our members. And then you have the monitoring aspect because, again, as Rachel talked about, you have your mean time to resolution and, and you have to be very quick at understanding, you know, when things are, are not working so that you can resolve them and really do those earlier in the pipeline. That's not just something to be worried about in production. You really should be testing that capability all the way through the pipeline so that, you know, if, if you have anything with monitoring that isn't working correctly, you can then you can then repair that just like every other thing that you're um, working towards on that release. But then on the culture side, right, you really have some of the, I always, we, we say kind of the technology is the fun part, the culture is the hard part, 
right? So, so if you're going to implement anything from a technology, it requires patterns, and patterns require you to reduce variance. So, so in our case, we're actually doing this across the enterprise, right? We, we use concepts such as model lines to run experiments with and then determine whether we want to go ahead and operationalize that capability. Um, but we're really trying to do this enterprise-wide. So having a lot of different variation that's not adding value is not helpful. So applying those kinds of lean concepts helps you implement technology solutions that you can then apply and are sustainable you know, across an enterprise of the size that we have. Uh, because you know, in our case, we have over 200 agile lines, so you know we have a large enterprise, 20 different business areas that we are, that we're serving. And a lot of the concepts also get around empowerment and trust and self-service, right? So we want teams to have more control over their own destiny. We want the team themselves knows better about the business they're serving and how best to serve them. So we want to empower them with the right tools and the right capabilities and trust that they will deliver as needed for their customers without a lot of centralized command and control types of structures. Um, and that means more self-service, right? So if they need infrastructure, if they need something, they should be able to apply that in a self-service way without having to go through some request response, which is going to add lead time to them trying to deliver. So those kinds of things are very important to really drive innovation and have a highly engaged workforce. So if you go to the next slide, um, it kind of shows, you know, the world that we kind of have lived in and the world that we want to get to, right? So in the old world, we really have large batch sizes, big bang types of releases where they become very complicated and it's no wonder we have long release times that take a lot of care and feeding, especially at the end of the release cycle. So it gets you into a vicious cycle because if you're only delivering a few times a year or quarterly, then the business is going to try to pack as much stuff in as possible. Sometimes I use the analogy of going to the grocery store. And if you only go to the grocery store once a month, you're probably, your shopping list is probably going to be very complicated. You're going to spend a lot of time in the store and you're going to end up probably buying stuff you don't need and also at the end of the month not being able to make a meal because you've run out of other things. So, so it kind of feeds itself. So, so in order to move to this other model, you, you have to demonstrate to the business you can actually run an experiment or have a lead time that will allow them you know, to feel comfortable in giving you small batches of work. So, so having those small batch sizes and as Rachel said, you know, dependencies are really friction to accelerate delivery. So how do you reduce those dependencies? Well, batch sizes is one, APIs is another. Um, some of these concepts like dark launching or feature flag is another. So, so get those small batch sizes to allow you to simplify your releases, and then you know you can shorten your lead time, and then and then that builds a different kind of trust factor because now the business trusts that if they continue to feed you these small batch sizes they'll continue to get the timely feedback that they need. So the next slide then talks about how we've, you know, the kind of the tool chain that we're using for this. So, so even though we have a large variation or a large variety in our portfolio, we certainly have mainframes and legacy systems and we have, we have uh, systems of engagement, mobile, et cetera, we really have the same flavor of delivery pipeline, if you will, for that. And obviously some of the technologies for for like the building and source code management and that may be a little different, but but in order to provide the same flow from a value stream perspective, we're actually flowing the work, all the work in this way. So it really starts with, you know, the business and their business features. Um, and then you know, there's also then the work, the defects or the unplanned work, right? And then you have work that you're doing as far as technical cards or refactoring, right? So it's kind of maps to the four types of work that you have from, again, the Phoenix project, right? You have your business value work, you have your unplanned work, you may have some operations and changes, but then you, you also have the work that you're doing refactoring 
um, your your system. So that work flows, you know, either through RC or Doors Next Generation. We use TaskTop to to do integration, um, TaskTop Integration Hub to do integration among some of the components of our pipeline into Rational Team Concert, where we then do our agile work and not just schedule it for the iteration, but also plan it for releases. So as Rachel said, yes, you want to be able to do your iteration, but you also have to do a little bit of planning into how these things are going to come together in releases. So that then flows into Urban Code Release, where we have a view of what's planned for our applications and also their pipeline view, right? So that's where you can actually see the pipeline that they're going to go through in terms of of system tests, performance tests, whatever things that they need to go through in order to gain what we call readiness certification to deliver, right? So we don't want to deliver based on a calendar. We want to deliver based on readiness. So as soon as the application is deemed ready, because they've gotten all the certifications they need, again, not sacrificing quality, then they're ready to be deployed. Um, and we'd like to do that in an automated fashion. So we're working to get some of our testing results and other results automated through Urban Code Release so that they can then be visible and move through that pipeline. At the same time, you actually have what's being built. So there's, there's some integration capability between Urban Code Deploy and Git and UCD and Jenkins that allows you to actually see the stories that are in a build so now you kind of have the view of what was planned, what's actually in the version of the code that you built. And so as you move it to the pipeline, there's really no guesswork to what you're getting here. You can see exactly what you have. You can see exactly what certifications you've earned so that you have a very high confidence that when you're ready to release, you actually can go ahead and then release it. And then, and then we're also looking at automating that change process with ServiceNow again using task stops so that as soon as the code is ready we can automate that and at that point you can go you know and, and start to get feedback right so you know we a system like a new relic or something where you're collecting feedback both operationally and, and from the customer side to then feedback to the business so this is the pipeline that we actually now have set up and we have teams adopting and we're running experiments of how to get faster because um, you know, we really want to take advantage of, of some of the technology here and apply some of those cultural factors to see how fast we can actually go to reduce our lead time to be able to provide, be more responsive to the business. And with that, I think I'll turn it back to Charlene for uh, Donovan's uh, Great. Thanks, Ka uh, <laughs> excuse me. Thanks, Carmen. Great, great information. I'm sure our, our folks got a lot of uh, really good uh, information out of it. Um, I do want to remind the audience that if you have a question for Rachel or for Carmen or for uh, Donovan, as who, who's about to speak, um, please feel free to send in your questions anytime. We do have a couple good questions in so far, um, but I want to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to. So please don't uh, don't delay. Get your questions in. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Donovan now who I'm sure also has lots of really great uh, information from some lessons learned uh, in, uh, in DevOps. So uh, take it away, Donovan. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, exactly. My, I guess my part of this uh, presentation is going to be uh, practical lessons that we've learned and um, practical ways that we apply DevOps techniques or technologies to help our organization be more efficient, more agile. And I, I heard two things that Carmen and Rachel each, uh, or one thing uh, that they each said that I think is really true uh, if you want to be successful uh, you know, with DevOps, and that is uh, it's a journey. Um, it takes a while to get to a point where you are really agile in terms of uh, identifying issues in your environment or places where your development teams can improve or uh, delivering new functionality uh, to uh, actually delivering that functionality and then also 
uh, everyone is responsible for the delivery. Um, I am sort of, I guess, on the operation side of uh, the organization because uh, I'm on the monitoring team. Uh, but there's a lot of crossover between operations and development now, even more from the, de the operations side to development. And from a monitoring standpoint, you know, we monitor all of the enterprise systems uh, in our organization. So, so uh, all of the tax revenue collection systems, um, as well as all of the customs uh, systems, so all of the port of entries in South Africa. So we have visibility into all of the applications and all of the systems. So we're a critical part of the uh, giving the organization or the development teams the ability to see where there are issues, where there are needs for improvement, uh, provisioning, etc. So uh, I guess I want to reiterate, um, I also agree that uh, everyone is responsible and it, it's a journey. So let me quickly tell you guys about um, South Africa and what we as an organization do. So. Um, as I mentioned before, we are the South African Revenue Service, so we collect tax revenue uh, in the country uh, for individual taxpayers as well as companies. We're actually coming up to our um, end of uh, fiscal year here at the end of March, so this is a busy time for us. Um, so, and we also manage and are responsible for all of the import and export uh, trade, basically, that flow through our um, border posts. So we have 72 port of entries in South Africa, uh, which includes uh, airports, land, uh, border posts, um, harbors. Uh, being at the tip of Africa, obviously, we're uh, sitting in a major uh, shipping route. And we also have um, a few border posts, land border posts, that are uh, biggest in terms of the amount of cargo uh, that flow through those ports in all of Africa. So cargo that comes in and out of uh, South Africa and go out to other countries in Africa with the largest uh, export point, if you will, import and export point. So from a tax revenue collection standpoint, obviously it's critical for us to uh, be up and available, uh, to have those systems perform. Um, we integrate with the banks, with credit bureaus, um, we integrate with the IRS in America. There's a lot of integration points. But if the tax systems are down, which they never are, you know, as a taxpayer, you have to come back tomorrow <laughs> because there's only one place to file your taxes and that's with us. But customs is a whole different story. For customs, uh, I guess the level of criticality in terms of managing those systems uh, is, is of the utmost importance. Uh, if you think about uh, container ships coming into a harbor with perishable goods, um, those things cannot sit in the harbor for too long before it has to be offloaded and on trucks and um, transported throughout Africa. Uh, those are, there are in fact penalties associated with cargo sitting in the harbors um, for uh, you know in excess of a, a certain period of time. So the, all of those systems uh, we monitor and manage those systems and we are in uh, alignment and there's definitely a level of synergy between us and the uh, uh, various development teams and stakeholders to ensure that those systems are always performing and um, there are times when legislation changes uh, in our country uh, either uh, trade legislation or tax legislation in fact our Minister of Finance uh, about a couple of weeks ago delivered his State of the Nation address and there was a number of tax legislation changes where there's increases in uh, tax on tobacco or alcohol or whatever the case may be obviously to stimulate the country's um, economic growth. We don't have months or years to implement those things. Um, we literally have 
a short window uh, from weeks, uh, maybe a maximum of a month from when the minister delivers the State of the Nation address to when we actually implement those um, changes in our system. So it's critical for us, even though we are an organization of 14,000 people spread across uh, South Africa, uh, 72 port of entries, uh, we have about 50 to 60 uh, tax branches where you can walk into and talk to a tax consultant and file your taxes. Um, we at our corporate, uh, we have six regional data centers. So our environment as uh, is as a complex as any environments uh, that I've ever seen. And I've done a fair amount of traveling over the world and worked with Fortune 100 and 500 companies. And we are actually at a point where we can turn around things like that in a matter of weeks. Uh, and it's due to the fact that we use DevOps uh, methodologies, uh, technologies, techniques, and also, uh, as I said, there's definitely a, a, a great amount of crossover and um, people taking responsibility for delivery but across the organization. Um, a practical example, I guess, uh, that I can use is that um, in the past week, uh, in one of our customs uh, environments uh, in WebSphere, we had a memory leak on one of the systems. And uh, people uh, noticed this and it was causing some problems and I was able to use our diagnostics tool to delve or to you know dive into uh, the code and we could identify um, what the specific classes and method calls in the application was that was leaking memory. And we could relay that information back to the development team who in turn isolated uh, what the problem was and was able to quickly test it um, in an in a, in a environment that was again sort of lent it to, de to a DevOps uh, uh, um, technologies tested it and in a matter of days we were able to redeploy that application and um, alleviated the problem and fixed the problem. And so you need that definitely that level of um, uh, cooperation between teams and understanding that um, we're not working in silos anymore um, and that um, we're all responsible for the delivery. I think we can click to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, so, as I mentioned, um, I'm not exaggerated or, or exaggerating when I say that our country's economy depends on um, our organization, uh, our organization's ability to be agile. Um, when we deploy new functionality, when we implement uh, legislation from our, you know, governmental leadership, um, it it actually uh, we are the treasury, uh, if you think about it. So uh, it's 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 a critical part of our um, delivery, uh, and as I've mentioned before. It is a journey. It's taken us um, maybe about five or six years, I guess, um, from when we started sort of this modernization uh, effort and 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 project uh, unto unto the point where we are now. Where um, last year we had an annual uptime of 99.995 percent. So for an organization like us, with the amount of people, with the amount of uh, uh, transactions, um, which ob obviously are in the millions, uh, critical um, customs declarations and responses, risk analysis, inspections that need to happen at the border post. For us to have an annual uptime like that uh, is something that we're that we're very proud of. So, so I'm not going to go into all of these tools uh, and what we use it for. I think people. On the on the uh, webinar, probably 
are familiar with most of it. I think something I want to mention too is obviously we're a, we're a big IBM partner and there are important reasons why we partner with IBM um, and that's because IBM gives us the guarantees that we need as a, a governmental agency responsible for uh, the treasury of the country. Uh, they give us the guarantees in a partnership that we need to ensure that we can deliver uh, an excellent service to our customers. So we obviously have a lot of IBM technologies, software and hardware, but we also use open source technologies too. And I think to be successful in the DevOps space, you need to be able to um, to blend uh, enterprise solutions as well as open source technologies, because there are wonderful open source technologies out there and uh, mm -hmm. community supported. So uh, these are some of the tools that we use. Um, as I said, I'm not going to go into everything. I I'm on the team that uh, manages and have built uh, a really fantastic uh, monitoring and event management foundation that supports all of the stakeholders uh, in SARS in terms of the different teams that are responsible for the different enterprise applications and components. So all of the, the Tivoli stuff, the, um, the uh, APM stuff, Netcool, um, there's a lot of the WebSphere work that we do too, even though we're not, not the WebSphere team per se. So uh, in essence, uh, it facilitates fast and effective changes to our enterprise systems. And um, that's pretty much my story. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Donovan. Um, again, you know, learning by experience, that, that's the best teacher sometimes. So uh, it's great to see here that you guys are, are doing so well there. Um, okay, so now that we've got those under our belt, we do want to give you a quick, uh, a quick preview of IBM Interconnect, which is quickly approaching. Um, uh, do invite, uh, IBM invites uh, you to Interconnect. We've got a ton of things happening. Uh, at the event, uh, we've got there will be sessions, there will be activities, there will be workshops, there will be um, clients. Um, Rachel, I don't know if you if you want to do any speaking regarding this uh, interconnect. If you have any insight that you'd like to share, but I do know that um, all three of uh, our today's panelists do have some uh, speaking sessions, uh, and Alan will will have a speaking session as well. So. Um, so Rachel, why don't you tell us a little bit about your session, and then Carmen, you can tell us about yours, and then Donovan, you can tell us about yours. Yeah, I'm. Um, I have a couple of sessions. Some that are listed here, and some that are not. Um, I'm going to be speaking with Pixie, which is a startup uh, that is doing work here in the garage. Uh, that's a retail startup. So we're going to be talking about kind of their journey and where they're they are on that. Uh, and I'm going to be doing a presentation uh, with one of my developers about what we do here in the garage, how we apply DevOps and design thinking, and go through some client case studies. Uh, and then the one that's shown here is um, talking about innovation, and we're going to be talking about a lot around the organizational side of things. Um, that we've been doing some work with Bendigo Adelaide Bank. Uh, that part is on the inner circle part of um, of interconnect. So those are some of the activities that, that I have going on. Great. Thanks. And Cartman? Uh, yeah, so I'm on a panel that Sanjeev Sharma is leading, who's a, another distinguished engineer whose book is shown on the left, I think, the new book on the DevOps adoption playbook. Um, and he'll have a few other industry leaders with him on that panel. And then I'm doing a lightning talk. It's the first time I'm trying this. So I guess these are like 20 minute kind of TED talks um, where I'm going to tell, talk about some of the tales in terms of, you know, what what we've done and what's worked and, and what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, not only us, but what I think I've learned from other companies um, from uh, the, some of the great things they've been able to do. Great, great. And, and Donovan, what will you be talking about? 
So I'm gonna. My session is gonna be basically be a, a, about our journey um, and how we got to the 99.995 percent uptime um, from when we started our project or the journey, essentially, and uh, how we got got to where we are now. Um, what the perception was in the beginning and how our organization now rely on these tools to uh, to be effective and efficient. So a little bit of, uh, about what I talked about today, but I guess more in depth of, you know, the, the whole journey story. Nice. Okay, great. Thanks. And of course, Alan will have uh, his discussion, Enterprise DevOps, It Takes a Village. So I'm sure he would love it if everybody would join him during that presentation. Also at Interconnect, uh, there will be a number of workshops. Let's go ahead and change the slide. Um, you can see on the right there's a workshop schedule, um, but uh, we've got 90-minute uh, formats uh, that include hands-on exercises to help um, folks learn by doing in addition to hearing. So um, they'll include a lot of uh, expert commentary from DevOps leaders. Um, excuse me, and uh, it'll also enable you to speak with your peers about the, your DevOps journey and transformation. So um, they do require uh, pre-registration though, so if you are interested in any of the workshops, you can, uh, you see the, the, um, the URL right there, you can just click on that and uh, log on, uh, register for the workshops. Okay, doing a time check here. Um, oh, I think we have one other thing. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, advance the slides. We also, uh, IBM also will have a crowd chat, which is, I think it's a it's a fairly new uh, um, thing for IBM to have for Interconnect. Friday, March 10th, it's happening before this this Friday, so it's happening before IBM Interconnect. Um, kind of give you a, a sneak peek at what's coming up. We've got Alan, who's going to be hosting it, I believe, and uh, of course the um, legendary Gene Kim, uh, along with Angel Diaz and Eric Minnick will be part of that crowd chat. So please um, uh, log on, listen in, and share your stories. I'm sure they would love to hear that. And then you can also vote for your key DevOps trends in 2017. Interesting stuff. OK, so it looks like we have about five minutes left for some questions from the audience. And it's not too late if you do have a question for Rachel or Carmen or Donovan, please feel free to put your uh, question in. Um, let's go ahead and start with, um, let's see, I believe this message, this question is for, um, uh, for Carmen. So the first one is, is infrastructure provisioning automated in your, in your uh, solution? So that's one of the things we have some automated infrastructure provisioning capability but we want to improve that um, so that's one of the things on our roadmap I think whether you're going to from looking at external or internal cloud right you need some capability for that kind of uh, infrastructure provisioning you know obviously we're looking at things like dock or things like that and um, to also help us there so um, it's part of our journey. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have some, but it's something that we're moving very quickly to get more of and have it more self-service. Gotcha. Okay. Quick follow-up question to that. Um, how do you manage governance from a, kind of a dollar's consumption standpoint as well as performance? Um, so I guess I'll answer it this way. I think... I think one of the culture elements, and I don't know what this is the intent of the question, but I'll use it to get on kind of one of the soapbox things we talk about from culture. <laughs> I think one of the culture elements here is you really don't want to charge people more for doing the right thing. So, you know, in the past we've had examples where if people were taking advantage of some service, they had to pay for it. If they wanted additional features, they had to pay more for it. If they're, if you really are, if they're, if an area is really doing something, a team's doing something you want them to do, then you don't want to charge them more for doing that. Right now, 
if there's if they're on a legacy tool or there's something else that you're trying to move people off of then again you know you can use cost from that perspective to try to influence culture so so I think more we're looking at if we're, people are adopting and doing things the right way right we don't want them to have to pay for that um, we want to somehow spread that out so that teams can do the right things do what we want them to do and, and it's not a financial limitation to doing that okay great I have a generic question here from Amrish uh, so anybody uh, feel free to jump in and answer it um, have any of you seen a compromise in quality as speed trumps everything I guess I can talk a little. I mean, if you look at the DevOps, state of the DevOps report, what it says pretty clearly is teams that are the high performers, which are going faster, actually have higher quality. So I think that's an imperative that we've put in place is that we're not sacrificing quality. I think Rachel talked well about this. We're saying that these mechanisms actually will help you be more productive. And I think getting the Donovan's talk actually help your mean time to resolution by giving you more time to spend on business features and less time mitigating problems. So um, it's not a reckless approach to go fast. It's, it's a controlled approach that will allow you to go faster and still ensure that you're staying on the road and, and, and providing high quality. I mean, that's, that's kind of our perspective. And I think when we talk about going faster, part of it is, is um, in the more mature DevOps um, situations or teams, you know, testing is being done very early. Uh, the integration of tests and this deployment to production uh, rapidly and, you know, sort of continuously and doing integration early, all of that leads to the detection of any problems earlier in the process, which then saves um, saves on the time, overall cycle time. So you're getting that savings, but in fact, I think you are driving to better quality. I think the thing that um, you need to adjust for, you know, adjust your thinking for, is that your, your developers, if you're doing test-driven development, may be spending just as much time, even more of their time, writing tests, automated tests, than they are writing the actual code and so it can even sort of feel like oh maybe they're going slower but in fact from an overall life cycle perspective they're not and that behavior is driving very high quality not just in the automation of the test but in the thinking through of all of the error situations etc. I think that where you can see quality challenges is where um, where frankly the team isn't trained enough um, or there maybe clock. aren't enough experienced people with some new technologies, things like that. I think that's where sometimes you can get into, uh, into some pickups, right? So I know we have a lot, of, we have a mix of skills on my team and I always have to make sure there's some people involved in a project who have been through real, you know, production deployments and things like that. I have very talented junior developers, but they need that balance of, of different experiences on a team. Okay, great. Thanks to you both for answering that question. And unfortunately, uh, we have reached the top of the hour and uh, we have to close out today's webinar. But before we do, I would like to thank Carmen Diardo, Donovan Stevens, and Rachel Reinitz for being a part of today's session. Uh, please check the DevOps.com website for future webinars. And I hope everybody has a great day. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, guys.